be in the house of the Lord today. Amen. Y'all look great. Y'all really do. Let's, let's welcome our online church family as well. Will you help me in honoring them this morning? We are so glad that you are joining with us online, whether you're here in person or you're here with us in spirit. God's doing great and mighty things. Amen. He's doing great and mighty things. And I love that, David. This is how I fight my battles. Um, I think God's got a lot of good things for us this morning uh, because we're in our series entitled Next. Next. God's got something next for you, whether you know it or not. God's got something next. And we've talked about uh, in week one the space in between spaces. And I thought that was really anointed because that's kind of where we are as a church today. We're kind of in that middle ground, space between spaces. But sometimes God will do some of the most amazing things when you least expect it. Amen. Sometimes it'll be when you, when you don't uh, even know that he's working, but he's working when you don't even see it. Um, we, last week, we talked about uh, being sensitive to the direction of the Holy Spirit. Really being sensitive and following after God and not according to our plans. Because it's truly amazing what happens uh, when, when men and women of faith will just follow after God, even if it's uh, in contradiction to our own plans. That God does have a will and His will will be done in heaven and on earth. Can I get a witness? Amen. Amen. So, with, without further ado, we've got a lot to cover this morning. And uh, whatever doesn't quite make sense today, I pray that you uh, receive understanding, if not today, at least next week, and that this will become more clear uh, in the following weeks. I, I pray you have more confidence, church, in, in what you ask God for. I, I pray that and I hope that what he will do next in your life, that you'll have confidence in that. And I pray that you see that every decision that you make, this is important, every decision you make can be used mightily and can be a, a God decision. And I just pray that you have greater understanding about his will in your life and that we don't limit God. Amen? Again, if we don't get it today, we'll get it next week. So before we get, begin, I, I just want us to get to know each other a little bit better today. Is that okay? So I'm going to ask you some questions. I want you to raise your hand if this is you, okay? <laughs> if, okay. If, if this is you, raise your hand. How many of you are the decision maker in your home? Okay, I saw some hesitancy. I saw some hesitancy. And then for you married couples, that both of you raised your hands. Yeah, that was a trick question. You can put your hands down. Yeah, for... That's a, that's a different series for a whole nother day. We don't have time to go down that path today. Uh, if, if Christy were in here, I wouldn't have raised my hand. Uh, okay, what about planners? How many of you are planners? I want, you to, I want to see the planners. Keep them up. Okay, planners, planners. Wow, a lot of planners. Put your hands down. Maybe you don't like the term planner. Maybe uh, who in here is a strategizer? Raise your hand if you're, ooh, keep them up. Keep them up. Y'all look around. These are the schemers. <laughs> hey, Amen. you can put them down. You can put them down. But, you know, you can kind of look around and figure out who's who. And if you're a planner or if you're a schemer or a strategizer or whatever, you don't have to raise your hand on this, but how many of you are like me and you have a hard time sometimes making up your mind? Uh, you don't have to, okay, that's fine. That's all of you. But I have a hard time making decisions sometimes, and I, apparently some of you do too. Some of you didn't know if I should raise my hand or not, or maybe... Uh, sometimes we have a hard time making decisions. And I get stuck in what I like to call analysis paralysis, right? There's this thin line between carefully weighing a decision and just being indecisive altogether, being locked down and, and not knowing what to do next because I can't fully comprehend everything because I've overanalyzed it to the point where nothing makes sense any, anymore. I, I don't think I'm alone in that, right? But I believe this usually happens to me in my life when it's uh, what I consider big decisions in my life. When I have big decisions, I don't want to misstep or mess up. I want to make sure it's a God decision, not a me decision. We've got a lot of big decisions happening for our church right now. And I, I really don't want it to be a wrong decision. I want it to be a God decision because we are to be stewards uh, of this thing that God has created here at Connect Church. Amen? And so usually when I get all stuck in analysis paralysis, that's when my wife Christy really balances me out. Uh, because on the big decisions, man, those are easy to her. She doesn't have any problem with the big, st the big stuff in life, the, the large moves. She's got faith to move mountains when it comes to that. It's the little things that lock her up, right? And I don't know if you're like Christy, but it's the little things that lock her up. Like um, when she's in her closet and she's looking at all her clothes and a, a full wardrobe, she'll look back at me and go, I've got nothing to wear. 
Amen. Or when I ask her, where do you want to go eat? See, I think we're hitting all the bases today, right? But we've got decisions in life that we have to make, and I'm not going to get to all of it today. Next week, again, I hope it brings clarity. But these are decisions. And, and let's just face it, our brains are being inundated with as many decisions or as the day is long every single day. You, you got to think about what to wear, what, what to eat, what, what to do in this min- instant, what to do in that instant. But that's why we need God so much. Because some decisions we think are just massive decisions. Some things we think are mundane decisions. But this is one of the reasons that we need God in our life so much. Because who do we think we are that we can even decide what decisions are massive or mundane in our life? I mean, there's some things in our life that are so insignificant, so small and minuscule, we'll think that they're small decisions in our life, but really God can take the most minuscule, insignificant thing and he can do mighty things with that small thing. Or the things that we think are so massive and so insurmountable, they're a piece of cake to God of the cosmos, amen? And so we need to understand that, that there is decisions to make, yes, but man, there's a God that's bigger than every decision that you'll ever have to make in your life. And uh, I just really, really, really believe that the Lord touched my heart this week. I believe that he blessed me in study this week. And I want to reveal that to you and what I think he has for us next. This week and, and next week, I believe God wants to bless you in your decision-making process and let you know that even every decision you make when given back to God, uh, it can be a God decision. Amen. So, well, I believe the Lord touched my heart. Let me tell you what the title of the message is, if you're taking notes, and then we'll, we'll go from there. Here it is. From barrenness to blessings. Let me say it one more time. From barrenness to blessings. I'm not talking about royalty like barren or baroness. I'm talking about emptiness, void. From barrenness to blessings. Usually when I'm stuck in that moment of indecision, I feel completely empty. Devoid of all rational thought. There's nothing going on up here. Wasteland, Right? Y'all know what I'm talking about. Sometimes, ladies, you ask your, your, your guy, hey, what are you thinking about? Nothing. There's really nothing going on up there, okay? But that's, that's barrenness. That's emptiness. Well, I, again, I thought this was amazing when I saw this in the Word of God this week. Um, barrenness is mentioned throughout the Bible. Throughout the Bible. But the Hebrew people, they perceived barrenness as a blight from God on you. Now, I, I do understand in Old Covenant, there is some wrath that comes on people, and we have to understand that. Well, the good news is that we are under the blood of Jesus, and no wrath of God shall ever find itself on us anymore because of what Jesus did. But they perceived, the Hebrew people, that if you were barren, then, then you, were, you were cursed by God. It definitely wasn't a blessing. In my studies, the Lord just shocked me. He took me down this path, this dotted line, this divine deviation, if you will, And it was this, that just because man perceives something to be one way doesn't necessarily dictate what God's going to do next. Okay, somebody's got to get excited about that. Just because man perceives something to be one way doesn't necessarily dictate what God will do next. God can do mighty things, and who are we to stand in his way? Have you ever perceived a time in your life where you thought to God, like, what have I done to deserve this? And I'm not talking about a Lauren Daigle kind of way. What have I done to deserve a love life? I'm not talking about that good kind of stuff. I'm talking about, about cursed. You feel like it was a cursed season. Have you ever perceived a time in your life that you felt was blighted in some ways? Like damaged goods, a cursed season. Maybe you're in that season today and this message is just for you. You don't have to raise your hand, but you ever felt like that? Church, thank God that our perceptions don't limit God's grace or define His glory. Thank God that he can look right past our perceptions. And when man looks and sees damaged goods, God sees and he takes and he, he works it all together for our good. Amen? When, when man perceives something to be a curse, God reverses the curse and consecrates it beyond our comprehension. Our Holy Scripture says that Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it's written, Cursed is every man who hangs upon a tree. Church, I was cursed. But because of God Almighty, the blood of His Son, Jesus, and the power of the Holy Spirit, I'm blessed now, no matter what you think about me. Amen. No matter what you say about me, I'm blessed more than I know. And so are you at the blood of Jesus. Amen. Amen. So I went down this divine rabbit hole, and I just want, I want to reveal what God revealed to me this week, okay? 
And this is what I found, and I think it's awesome. Did you know that there are six women in the Bible that were barren in their wombs, yet God blessed them anyway, brought a blessing out of them anyway? Did y'all know there were six of them? I didn't, I mean, now if you're a Bible theologian, there might be more women in the Bible that you found, but I found six this week. So we're going to talk about the six that I found. Now, if you found any more than that, I would love for you to come and contact me and let me know about that. Let's all look at them real quick. Hey, guys, welcome. Give them a, give them a round of applause. Woo, we are so, oh, it's Tracy. Woo! Stand up. Give the Lord a praise. Amen. 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 Ain't God good? Woo. Hey, we didn't even plan that, did we, Noe? <laughs> Amen. Well, I, man, that blesses my heart. You know what? From barrenness to blessings, where there was no way, God saw a way. Man, there's nothing too small for God, nothing too great that he can't do. Woo. Man, I'm just excited. I'm glad to be here. If y'all didn't see what just happened, then you missed out. It was a miracle that just walked in the room right now. Amen. I don't even know where I was. There were six women. Six women in the Bible who, uh, who were barren. They couldn't bear children. And God opened up his heart towards them and brought a blessing out of barrenness anyway. Now, <clears throat> these women who were barren, I'm going to say it real quick. If you're taking notes, if you miss one, we're going to get to all six today. Were, were women like Sarai, who was Abram's wife. Rebecca, who was Isaac's wife, Rachel, who was Jacob's wife, people like Elizabeth and Hannah. See, the culture of their day, the Hebrew people, they would have perceived every single one of them as less than, as underclassed, as cursed. Yet God saw each one of these women as an opportunity to turn barrenness into blessings. And are y'all good to do a little Bible study this morning? Well, I was going to do it anyway. So... Most of us know the story about Abraham and Sarah, but before they were Abraham and Sarah, the father of many nations, the mother of, na of nations, uh, their names were Abram and Sarai. And God came to Abram and he said, one uh, will come from you that will be your heir. And the reason he said that was because Abram came to the Lord and said, I have no heir. In my old age, all I have is this servant. Is this going to be who I give everything to, this land that you promised me? And God said, no, there's actually going to be one who's your very own. Well, in Genesis chapter 16, though, Sarai hears this and God's promise to Abram. And she knows God's promise to Abram and she makes a decision. And I want us to look at that decision today. And this is in Genesis 16, verse 1. <clears throat> now, Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children. And she had an Egyptian maidservant whose name was Hagar. So Sarah, he said to Abram, See now, the Lord has restrained me from bearing children. You see the perception? You see what the Hebrew people were, were, were thought uh, of barrenness at this time? God is doing this thing to me. That's the perception. I'm blighted. I'm damaged goods. God's doing this thing to me. I wonder how many times, church, we try to limit God by not letting go of so-called truths that we hold so tightly onto. We put words in God's mouth, church, that he's never once spoken over us. And that's exactly what she's doing here. And I, I, she's saying, I know this is God's will for our life. You've heard a promise from the Lord. You know where this is headed. You know where this thing is going. But since I'm limited, since I'm unqualified, or because I've listened to what others have said my whole life about me, we got to figure this thing out. we got to make this thing work. we got to make this thing happen based on what we see and feel and know. Church, when are we going to learn that we got to walk by faith and not by sight? we got to have faith to see past our own limitations and our own qualifications and know that there's no limit, right, Tracy, to what God can do. Amen. Amen. There's none more qualified than the God of the cosmos. And so she's having a hard time here in verse 2, and she says, The Lord's keeping me from bearing children. Please go into my maid. Perhaps I shall obtain children by her. Abram said, okay. I love doing that. Y'all don't always like that. But Mike laughs and Janice laughs really loud at that time. 
This is, actually, this is the first time he heard what his wife told him the first time she told him. And he heeded, he heeded the word of Sarai, his wife. Now, how many of you know that wasn't God's plan or intentions for Abram and Sarah, Sarai, right? That wasn't the highway of God's best for their life. So Abram had a son with his wife's servant, a slave girl named Hagar. Sarai didn't like it. Imagine that. You ever made a decision and then you had to eat the consequences of your choices? That's what she's doing. She didn't like the consequences of her choices. And so the Bible says she treated Hagar harshly. I don't know what that meant, but I can only imagine it wasn't good. Hagar didn't appreciate it and she fled. She fled. She said, I, I'm out of here. And she went and she found this well. And she's weeping by this well. And the Lord turned his heart towards Hagar at this well. And I want you to see after God blesses Hagar at the well, her response to the Lord. I thought it was beautiful. Then she called the name of the Lord who spoke to her. You are the God who sees. For she said, have I also here seen him who sees me? Therefore, the well was called Bir La Hairoi, which means, and it's translated, well of the one who lives and sees me. Isn't it comforting in no church that he is the God that sees? That he sees what you're going through? He knows what you're experiencing? That you're not alone? Like David said, we're surrounded by the Lord God Almighty. And he sees you. He's the one that lives and sees you. I love that. Now think about, you know, God saw the plight of this Egyptian slave. He had compassion on her. And he blessed her. Just like God saw and heard the plight of his children, Israel, who were slaves to Egypt, he saw them and he blessed them. Just like God heard our plight and saw who we were in Adam, slaves to sin, and he blessed us. Amen? He's the God who sees you. He's the God that lives and sees me. I love that. And later in Genesis 17 and 18, God visits Abram again. And he changes their names to Abraham and Sarah, the father of nations, the mother of nations, ruler of peoples. And what's interesting was God declared all that before they had their first child together. Okay, y'all don't look shocked by that, but I thought it was pretty awesome. And I've said it before, maybe you, you've heard it before, but God declares your end at your beginning God called things that were not as though they were because they already are in Him. Our hope, church, is in the Lord God Almighty who already knows what's next. That's what we said last week. And so, <clears throat> you don't have to know how He's going to do it or how He's going to work things out or even when things are going to work out. It's just God wants you focused on Him who already knows what's next. He'll change your name. He'll declare things that are not as though they were because they already are in Him. And he is the author and finisher of your faith. So he names them Abraham and Sarah. And yet they still laughed at God. Both of them. Abram on one account and Sarah on the next account. And they laugh in the face of God when God says, I'm going to do the impossible through you. They laughed. Can I get a witness that sometimes God is, is, is looking down at us and saying, I'm going to do the impossible through you. And you go, <laughs> Amen. But can I get witness that God can and he will? Amen. Amen. Genesis 18 is that account. And the Lord said to Abram, Abraham, why does Sarah laugh, saying, Shall I surely bear a child since I am old? <clears throat> is there anything too hard for the Lord? At the appointed time, I will return to you according to the time of life, and Sarah shall have a son. Church, ask yourself, is there anything too hard for the Lord? No, I didn't think so. He said, at his appointed time. And by having faith in the one who said it is also the one who will accomplish it. Just church, watch how God will turn your barrenness into blessings. Amen? And we know the story. Abraham and Sarah had a promised seed, Isaac. Isaac, from barrenness to blessings. i got to move real quickly for the sake of time. Uh, the second example was Rebecca. Rebecca was also, she was the wife of Isaac. She was barren. And Isaac pleaded before the Lord for Rebekah's sake that she would conceive. And the Lord doubly blessed Rebekah, because I don't know if you remember, but she said, there's like a war in me. 
And God says, says, you have two nations fighting inside of you. One will be Esau and one will be Jacob. I thought that was beautiful. So the Lord blessed uh, Isaac and Rebekah, and they had a promise. See, Jacob, well, Jacob's wife too, Rachel, she was barren. And the word of God says that he listened to Rachel and opened her womb and she gave birth to Joseph. Now, I don't know if you're really taking mental note of everything that we've talked about here, church, but this is big. Because... <clears throat> of who these women were and how important they are to our salvation. Right? Because we serve the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Right? There would be no promised seed of Abraham for us if God didn't turn barrenness into blessing. There would be no Isaac without the miracle of what God did through Sarah. There would be no Jacob had the Lord not blessed Rebekah. There would not even be a nation of Israel had God not listened to Rachel and blessed her with Joseph, the coat of many colors, who saved his family and his nation from famine. Do y'all remember that? It was Joseph that found favor with Pharaoh that allowed Israel to have its own land in Goshen where they were abundant and blessed and they prospered. Church, I think that was so powerful in my studies this week. And our very salvation hinged on the fact that God chose what others saw as less than or what others saw as cursed. God chose those things to reveal His glory by turning barrenness into blessings. Amen? Uh, let's look at three more women that were touched by barrenness in the Bible. And these, these next three, they just bless my heart. Elizabeth. Y'all remember Elizabeth? Elizabeth, she was the cousin of Mary, the mother of Jesus. Cousin of Mary, the mother of Jesus. And she too was barren. Her, her family was of the tribe of Levi. They were priests in the house of God. Uh, we, we don't have time to go look at that account right now. It's in Luke chapter 1, if you want to find it in your own searching time this week. Luke chapter 1. The angel of the Lord came to Zacharias, who was Elizabeth's husband at the time. And, she, and the angel of the Lord, Gabriel, visited Zacharias in the temple of God. And the angel told, told him that God heard your prayer, Zacharias. God heard your prayer, and your wife Elizabeth shall have a son. And Zacharias did what all of us do, right? And he questioned the angel of the Lord. He said, how shall this be? Will you show me how this will come to pass? For I am an old man, and my wife is celebrating her third 29th. Something like that. We're old. And the angel, if you'll recall, he made him mute, where he couldn't speak again until the child was born. Man, I thought that was, you asked God for a sign. It goes to show you, don't question the Lord your God. Lord, will you give me a sign? Don't speak. You can't speak for a year. I would say thank you, but I'd be mute, right? I see some of you are like, I wish my husband would ask Gabriel. <laughs> no, 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 we're moving on. But church, we know the story. Her barrenness was turned to what? Her greatest blessing. Her barrenness was turned to blessing. Because she was blessed at the conception, but also at the birth of her son, John the Baptist. Man, church, I hope you're seeing how powerful this is. I also thought it was really amazing how the light bearer, John the Baptist, remember, he wasn't the light. Jesus was the light that came into the world. But he was the light bearer. He was the one to, to prepare the way of the light, to prepare the way of the Lord Jesus but John was born into a Levite family. And I thought this was so good because the Levites, if you remember, were the priests of the Mosaic law. It was the law and the priesthood that was synonymous. When you said Levite, you knew law. And the law was the old covenant that prepared a way for the new covenant. And John was the light bearer now to prepare a way for the Lord Jesus. And that's why he said, after me comes one greater than I. And if you recall, John even also said, Hey, I must decrease. He said, Jesus must increase and I must decrease. But church, the law shouts the very same thing. There's one greater than me, a covenant greater than I that comes after me. A better covenant founded on better promises. The law shouts that Jesus must increase and I must decrease. Isn't that good? I thought that was so cool too. How God just has puzzled all this together and made it one picture. The law shouts Jesus must increase. So, so thank you. Thank you, God, for blessing us with John the Baptist. Hannah, maybe, maybe some of you haven't heard the story of Hannah, but Hannah, she was, she was barren too. And Hannah's story is kind of a sad one. Sorry to say it, Hannah, it's kind of a sad one. Because here's what happened. She was provoked. 
She was made fun of for not having any kids. She was chastised and ridiculed for not having any kids. Remember what the Hebrews' perception of being barren was. So every year she would go up to the temple to make offering to the Lord, but she'd be chastised every time to the point she'd be in so much pain that she wouldn't eat the whole time she was there. She just wept and wept and wept. And one night in her anguish and pain, she wept and she was praying to the Lord to give her a son. And she made a promise to God, if, if you would bless me, Lord, with a son, then I would give that boy back to you and no razor shall come upon his head. And she's stumbling and she's weeping and she's praying this. And Eli, the priest of the temple, he saw her in weeping and her anguish and praying, but her lips were only moving. No, no sound was coming out. She was just praying to herself. And so he misperceived the situation, even the priest. He looked and he said, she's drunk. She's drunk. And I want you to, to see that account with me here. So Eli said to her, how long will you be drunk? Put the wine away from you. But Hannah answered and said, no, my Lord. I am a woman of sorrowful spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor intoxicating drink, but I've poured out my soul before the Lord. Do not consider your maidservant a wicked woman, for out of the abundance of my complaint and grief I have spoken until now. Then Eli answered and said, Go in peace, and the God of Israel grant your petition which you have asked of him. And she said, Let your maidservant find favor in your sight. So the woman went her way, and ate and her face was no longer sad you know there's something about comfort food in there but it wasn't the food that made her no longer sad she heard Eli say go in peace may the Lord grant your petition and Hannah's barrenness church was turned into a blessing and she gave birth to a boy named Samuel Samuel now if you'll recall Samuel he was dedicated back to the temple. She kept her agreement with God, right? She gave him back to the Lord. No razor shall be upon his head. And Samuel became the prophet who anointed both Saul, the first king of Israel, and David, his successor as kings of Israel. Now, let's look at our final example of how God will turn barrenness into blessings. And again, if we don't get it all this week, I pray you get it next week. It's in Judges chapter 13. Judges chapter 13, verse 2. A certain man of Zorah named Manoah from the clan of the Danites had a wife who was childless, unable to give birth. And the angel of the Lord appeared to her and said, you are barren and childless. And she said, no, duh. But you are going to become pregnant and give birth to a son. Hallelujah. Now see to it that you drink no wine or fermented drink and that you have not eat anything unclean. Hmm. And you will become pregnant. And the have a son who has, whose head is never to be touched by a razor because the boy is to be a Nazarite, dedicated to God from the womb. He will take the lead in delivering Israel from the hands of the fields. Now that sounds eerily familiar to what we just heard about Hannah's account, right? That no razor shall touch his head. We'll talk about that more in a moment. But this is big news. She's getting word from an angel of the Lord. She just doesn't know who this man is, is telling her she's going to be pregnant. So she comes back and she tells her husband. Look at what she says to her husband. The woman went to her husband and told him, a man of God came to me. He, he looked like an angel of God. Very awesome. I, I didn't ask him where he came from and he didn't tell me his name, but he said to me, you will become pregnant. Uh-huh. I see. <laughs> so this awesome looking man as pretty as an angel said you're going to be pregnant right and he came to my wife saying what again that you're going to be pregnant and you're going to have a son now then drink no wine nor other fermented drink and do not eat anything unclean because the boy will be a Nazarite of God from the womb until the day of his death then Manoah prayed to the Lord pardon your servant Pardon your servant, Lord. I beg you to let the man of God you sent to us come again to teach us how to bring up the boy who is to be born. In other words, he's saying, I got some questions for this guy. And he needs some answers. And so God heard Manoah. Church, this is powerful. God what? God heard Manoah. 
He's the one that lives and sees me. Amen? Look to the one next to you and say, He sees me. Now look to somebody else and say, He hears me. Come on, say it louder than that. Say, He hears me. Church, He hears you. Better than Google. Amen? He hears you. And we need to understand that God is the one who lives and sees me. God heard, if you remember, who to hear? He heard Abram. God heard Isaac. He listened to Rachel. He answered Zacharias. He fulfilled Hannah's request. And now he heard Manoah's wife. So God heard Manoah, and the angel of God came again to the woman. Well, Manoah's the guy who's asking God to send the angel again. God, will you send this man to us? But God sends him to the woman. And Manoah's the one who asked. It goes to show you that God's going to do it in his own way. Amen? You might perceive that God's going to do it one way, but he's going to do it his way, and I guarantee you his way is better. It might not look like you perceive it to look or be how you perceive it to be, but God's going to have it his way. And so the man approaches Manoah's wife again. And the angel of God came to the woman, and she was out in the field. But the husband Manoah was not with her. And the woman hurried to tell her husband, He's here! He's here! The man who appeared to me the other day. Manoah got up, and he followed his wife. And when he came to the man, he said, Are you the man who talked to my wife? And he asked him, and the angel said, Yes, but let's skip down to verse 15. Manoah said to the angel of the Lord, We would like you to stay until we prepare a young goat for you. The angel of the Lord replied, Even though you detain me, I will not eat any of your food. But if you prepare a burnt offering and offer it to the Lord, I love that. And we're going to talk about it more in detail in a moment. But he said, I'm not going to eat what you're providing me, but if you will give it back to God. And Manoah did not realize that it was the angel of the Lord. He still thinks it's just this fine-looking man talking to his wife. And he's going to feed him. Then Manoah inquired of the angel, What is your name? So it may honor you when your word comes true. And he replied, why do you ask my name? It is beyond understanding. It's beyond understanding. Amen, church? We need to understand that's where we find God, beyond what we can understand. We keep trying to find God in our reasonings, and our understandings, but it's not found where we can comprehend it. It's found beyond where we can understand. In verse 19, he goes on to say, Then Manoah took the young goat together with the grain offering and sacrificed it on the rock to the Lord. And the Lord did an amazing thing thing while Manoah and his wife watched. What did the Lord do? The flame blazed up from the altar toward heaven and the angel of the Lord ascended in the flame. Seeing this, Manoah and his wife fell with their faces to the ground. And when the angel of the Lord did not show himself again Manoah and his, to Manoah and his wife, Manoah realized that it was the angel of the Lord. We are doomed to die, he said to his wife. We have seen God. <laughs> Y'all laugh, but you'd be acting the same way. Right? Uh, I remember Paul on the road to Damascus. We'll probably talk about him next week. And Paul on the road to Damascus, once the Lord showed, uh, he said, he said, Lord, and he fell down at his face. He thought he was going to die because when you saw an unapproachable light in the old covenant, that's usually what came next. Manoah knew he saw the angel of the Lord and he was not going to survive it. But watch what Manoah's wife said. If the Lord had meant to kill us, He would not have accepted a burnt offering and a grain offering from our hands nor shown us all these things or now told us this. If God was out to get you, you'd be done by now. Your goose would be cooked. But but God didn't mean to kill us. And the woman gave birth to a boy and named him. Wow. He named him Samson. He grew and the Lord blessed him. Man, church, I want us to understand that God will take barrenness and he'll turn it into blessings. And this word that came from the Lord to Manoah and his wife, the angel of the Lord directed Manoah to give it back to the Lord. Make a burnt offering to the Lord. Everybody say, this is from God. If it's from God, if you're taking notes, write this down. If it's from God, you give it back to God. Let me say it again, and David did a great job talking about this this morning. If it's from God, you give it back to God. You give glory to God for what God has done. The very breath that I breathe is from the Lord. The worship that we do on Sundays is not time filler for me. It's where I take this borrowed breath and I give it back to Him. Amen. Your children, the scriptures say, are a reward from the Lord. We're just stewards while they're in our care. 
I pray that we're good stewards of them while they're in our care. But we're to give them back to God. It's one of the hardest prayers I've ever prayed as a dad is, is I can't, but you can. And I'm going to do the best I can, Lord, through, through me, God. Let your will be done. But I give my kids to you. They're yours. These are yours. You give our kids to the Lord. My financial blessings, church, they're not mine. They're all his. I should give it back to him. My gifts, my talents, they're not mine. They're from the Lord. Every good and perfect gift comes from above, and they're from God, the Father of lights, where there's no shadow or variation of turning. If they're from God, I should give it back to God. Amen. Amen. You praise God for that. You might have gifts and talents, and man, you're so gifted that you can, you can get worldly, worldly gain from everything that God has given you. Well, praise God that you're getting to, to put food on the table because what God's done through you. But your gifts, your calling, they need to be given to his kingdom too. Amen. When they're from the Lord, you give it back to the Lord. And I remember Paul said something like this in Ephesians. He said that we are God's workmanship, his craftsmanship, that we were created for good works, that we should walk there in them. So Abraham, what did he do with Isaac? Do you remember? He walked him up, he marched him up a mountain, and he was prepared to give Isaac the promised seed back to the Lord. He was about to put him on the altar. Actually, he put him on the altar. He bound his son up, and he took the knife, and he was ready to sacrifice the thing that God had given him because God asked it of him. And God steadied Isaac's hand with the hand of an angel, and he made for him a scapegoat caught in the thicket. Do y'all remember that? Man, church. It's the same thing that God did for us in Jesus. He gave us his very own son, the promised seed, and he made no way of escape for him. Jesus was the scapegoat that we all might live through him. Amen, church. Man, this is powerful. My very life, church, is not my own. It's his. I've been purchased. I've been bought with a price. If it's from God, I give it back to God. Amen? Amen. We can just keep praising God. Your life is not your own. And I know you're like, who are you you talking about, Trent? Don't fool yourself. It's his. And we need to give it back to him. Hannah and, 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 and this wife here that we read, she gave, they both gave the blessing back to God. And, and if you remember Samuel and Samson, they were both Nazarites before the Lord. And if you don't know what a Nazarite is, let me just tell you, there's a lot of things that you could offer to God in the old covenant law. You could give him a burnt sacrifice. You can give him an offering of incense. You can give him a grain offering. We just saw that with Manoah's wife and Manoah. But one thing that you could give back to God is you could give God a child. You could consecrate from the womb a child and give it to God, and that child should be called a Nazarite. Now, all of Numbers chapter 6, and I want you to go back in your own time this week and read it. All of Numbers chapter 6 is the vow of Nazarite. How you had to, to, to live in order to be a Nazarite and to dedicate this child back to God. And it says that the son shall eat of no unclean animal or touch any unclean thing. That the, the, the child shall not drink any uh, fermented drink. No razor shall be on their head. Doesn't that sound familiar? That's the qualifications of a Nazarite. And there's many more. And just in case you were wondering, anybody want to be a Nazarite? No? Russell might get away with it. No razor shall touch his head. But they were consecrating their children before the Lord. It was an offering to give back to God. And both of these women, church, they knew this vow. Hannah and Manoah's wife. But what I want you to see is this. When God turns barrenness to blessings... You give it back to him. If it's from God, you give it back to God for his glory. And watch this, and it blessed me so much this week. I think it's really amazing. In Numbers chapter 6, right after God told Moses how the children of Israel are to give a vow of Nazarite back to him, in the same chapter, there's nothing else in this chapter, this is what God did next. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to Aaron and his sons, the priests, saying, This is the way you shall bless the children of Israel. Say to them, 
The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you peace. So they shall put my name on the children of Israel and I will bless them. You give it back to God, church. And this is the blessing that God will put on you. This is the blessing God puts on your kids. This is something that we need to understand as we go into this next season. I've been praying for some people specifically this week. You know who you are. And if you're in a place today where you feel void or empty, if you feel barren or desolate, maybe you feel dried up like this is a dry season in your life, then now is your chance, just like these women, to ask God and ask of the Lord. First, John declares that We can go in confidence as we approach God, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, then whatever we ask, we know that we'll have what we asked of him. Ask God right now in your heart to turn your barrenness into your greatest blessing. God, would you turn this season in my life into blessing? God, would you turn this thing in my life into blessing? You may not know how he'll do it, You may not know when he will accomplish it, but whenever you ask, God, will you you grant this petition? Just know that he hears you. He is the one that lives, and he's the one that sees you. And whenever you receive of the Lord, you give it back to him and see how he'll take your blessing, church. He'll take your barrenness, and he'll make it your greatest blessing. Amen? Church, do you believe that this morning? Let's give God praise.